Welcome to the Steeple Church. If you've been before, welcome back. And uh, if you're not, if you're a visitor, then it's really good to have you here. And I pray God will bless you in these few words. I want you to say with me uh, something we say every week. God is good all the time. All the time. God, God is good. This reminds us that in all circumstances, we can trust God for his goodness. I'd like you to have a quick look at this picture just now. This gives you a hint of the theme of the service today. Uh, we're going to a military man and uh, you'll see this picture uh, gives you a sense of what they looked like in the days of Jesus in Galilee, the Roman centurion. I'm grateful today to uh, those who are helping us with the singing and uh, we're going to start the worship with Seek ye first the kingdom of God and finish with When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I want to thank Moira Bell for reading for us from Luke chapter 7 and to Michelle, our student minister, for leading us in prayer for others. Now let us pray. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Loving God, especially in times of trouble and uncertainty, we look to you for help. We thank you for the scriptures that tell us about you. We thank you for your encounter with the Roman soldier who came to ask you for help. Lord, when we can't solve problems on our own, remind us of his faith in you. Today we think of all who face difficult times and for whom life is not easy at present. Amen. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus 
and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and he built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not seen such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. An issue in these days of the pandemic is, are we all in this together? You know, are we all affected by this and living under it? Are we marching together in time? Are we all obeying the rules? Because in life, it's often easier to conform than to stand out. It actually takes bottle to be different and not to go with the flow of other people. I think of the words of Harold Thurman, the Afro-American preacher who used to say, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So marching to the beat of a different drum takes conviction. It takes courage. And I want to illustrate that today with the story that we read of the soldier in Capernaum. The text starts off by saying, there was a, a centurion servant whom his master, that's the centurion, valued highly. And he was, about to, he was sick and about to die. A word about Roman centurions. They were armor, army officers who commanded a hundred soldiers. Now, most of them were Gentiles. They were not Jews. Uh, they were sometimes, they could be Samaritans, which meant they were kind of half Jews. And so Jewish people tended to look down upon them. They tended to despise centurion soldiers. And another reason was they also re represented the Roman rulers. It has to be said also that many of them abused their power and they took unjust liberties. But it was not the case with the centurion soldier who loved his servant, the one that we read about this morning. The value that he placed on his servant was unheard of at the time of Jesus. Well, let's just think briefly about what centurion soldiers are like, because though they're soldiers, leaders in the Roman army, they are spoken very highly of in the New Testament. For example, there was the centurion at the cross, and Matthew records this. He says, when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. And then there was the centurion who said that, Jesus was dead to Pilate. You remember how Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And then later, there's the story of the God-fearing centurion, way back in uh, the book of Acts, talking about the story of the early church. It says at Caesarea, 
there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. Elsewhere in the book of Acts, we see more about centurions. They were, along with soldiers, rescuing Paul from being killed by a mob in Jerusalem. It was a centurion who prevented Paul from being scourged in order to get information from him. And centurions often protected Paul from being murdered and provided him with a military escort. And when holding him captive, often ensured that he was well cared for and that his friends were able to visit him. There's even an instance of one centurion who prevented a large group of prisoners from being executed during a shipwreck because he wanted to keep Paul alive. So what we can say is that the centurions that we know of in the New Testament of the Bible were men of faith, many of them, and they were certainly men of character. So, for example, normally when a centurion said march, 100 soldiers marched. When he said stop, they stopped. When he said jump, they jumped. And when he said go, they went. But in this case, the centurion soldier was sad and he couldn't tell his sadness simply to go away. It seems that in the opinion of the doctor in the band of disciples, that's Luke, the disciple doctor, that his diagnosis would be that the centurion servant really was badly ill. He had it bad. Actually, when you think about it, there are three things you never want to hear a doctor to say. One would be, oops. Another would be, I've never seen this before. And a third thing you wouldn't want a doctor to say to you would be, you'd better get your affairs in order. And I imagine that's just what Luke was thinking about in regard to this servant of the centurion. In fact, Matthew, when he tells the same story, he indicates that his sickness caused paralysis and agony. And generally, paralysis means you don't have any feeling but we're told that he was in pain, and so he really had the worst of both worlds. And you know, the centurion looked at him and hated to see him in such distress. You know what it's like when you're looking at a child in pain. And the centurion evidently was very kind, loving and generous, and he was thinking about getting this distinguished Jewish rabbi involved, Jesus. But he didn't want to offend him, so he sent the Jewish elders to ask him a favour. And the Jewish elders go to Jesus and they explain why Jesus should heal the centurion's servant. They beg Jesus earnestly because the centurion loves the Jews and because he had built a synagogue for them. They would say something like this, Jesus, we know he's a Gentile and we know he's a Roman centurion, but just this once, can't we overlook that? After all, look at how wonderful a person he is. He loves the Jews, and he even built a synagogue for us to study God's word in. Jesus, if any Gentile deserves help, this one does. He's a really good man. And in the Roman centurion, we find someone who had all the traits that Jesus expected one of his disciples to have. For example, see his love for others. It was said that he loves our nation. See his love for truth. It says he built our synagogue. See his humility. He said to Jesus, I do not deserve to have you come. And see his faith. He said, just say the word. I imagine, actually, that when Jesus praised this Roman centurion for his faith, that he probably annoyed a lot of his Jewish listeners. They were thinking, you know, to be a good person of faith, you should be a good Jew. 
And in Dundee today, it would be, I suppose, a little bit like praising people from a Muslim background who love Jesus. You know, we're just not used to seeing disciples like that. Or perhaps African Christians who praise God louder than Scots do. We're not just used to expecting people from other countries to outdo our praise and worship. I wonder what you expect a disciple of Jesus to look like and sound like. Well, this centurion was more concerned about others than he was about himself. He thought of others first and I wonder if perhaps someone has come to you uh, caringly and interested in you and they've ever said to you something like, you know, if you just had a bit more faith, you wouldn't be in the situation you're in. You know, in times of pain and loss, that's a very insensitive thing to say. Yet you don't have enough faith. You know, the difference between big faith and little faith is not really about quantity. It's not about percentages or degrees of trust in God. We don't have containers in our souls which overflow when our faith is great and are nearly empty when our faith is little. It doesn't work like that. Faith is confidence in something that God has said. And when you're persuaded something is true because God has said it or because of supporting evidence for it, then it can be said you have faith. So let me suggest a way of checking the quality, not so much the quantity, the quality of your faith. Ask yourself, how many of your prayers are motivated by self-interest? How many of your prayers are motivated for your own comfort or your advancement or your safety? And how much do you pray for people that others would not expect you to do? such as people from a Jewish background or people from Africa or other cultures. As Jesus was walking along towards the centurion's house, he sent his friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't trouble yourself. Actually, if you want to read the Greek, it actually has a kind of slang meaning. It says, don't skin yourself. Or we might say in Scots, don't bother yourself. The soldier who cared for his servant also cared about issues, inhibitions that Jesus might have felt. And so the centurion says, just say the word and my servant will be healed. You see, for him, it was enough for Jesus to simply speak the word from where he was and his servant would be healed. He said, explain this. He said, for I'm also a man placed under authority. Not that he thought he was equal with Jesus, but simply that he understood how authority works. I have soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. Another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And here he's making an argument from the lesser to the greater. He says, if I can speak a word and have done what I have and have what I say done, then if Jesus simply speaks the word, my servant will be healed. Now that really is faith, isn't it? I wonder if you can think of anything that you've ever said or you've ever done that would have caused Jesus to marvel. Because that's what happened when the centurion said these words, Jesus marveled. He was amazed. Actually, there's only one other time where Jesus is ever described as being amazed like this, but it's for a very different reason. It's when he, he visits his hometown of Nazareth and he marvels at the people's complete lack of faith. You can read about it in Luke chapter 4. However, in many experiences, many of our experiences, military people, soldiers, 
people who've served in the armed forces are like the Roman centurion. They're people of character. They're very down to earth. They're direct people. And I want you to see this as a model for being a disciple today, like the soldier who love, who, 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 who looked up at the cross, the centurion who said, truly this was the Son of God. Can you imagine being on the hill of Calvary and thinking as you see the crucified Christ before you, the words of the song that we're going to sing in a moment. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? I think of the soldier who loved being in the army his whole life, but whose ultimate allegiance was to the Lord. He said, I'm a soldier. But I belong to Jesus Christ, lock, stock and barrel. How about you? Let us pray together. A community of love. That's what you require of us, Lord God. And you showed us how in Jesus. The Christ who gathered people to him. Who yearned to shelter them from hurt and from harm. Who wanted only to love and to be loved. Here today, we want to be such a community. We are far from perfect but we have pledged ourselves to be your people and the steeple in Dundee and to serve your great purpose in whatever way we can, big or small. Everything we give, Father, we give in thankfulness for the road you travelled on our behalf, for the tears you shed the yearning you felt, the risks you took. Being faithful is a radical business. It involves stepping out of our comfort zones on new untrodden paths. Whatever the future holds, we may sense your presence and the decisions that we make and know that you are by our side, always. Being church can be a difficult business. It involves change and challenges, which many of us can find hard and difficult. Hear our prayers, that the Kirk locally and nationally might listen to your prompting, radically discard that that holds us back and move forward in faith with you. Being human is a testing business and one which you know only too well. Hear our prayers for those who walk in dangerous and lonely places today the refugee, the abused, the fearful, the hungry, the sick. We pray especially for the families of those grieving, for their families and for our congregation in these unsettling times. Give us companionship and isolation. Being in relationship is not always easy. We pray for those closest to us, 
We pray for our own families, friends and neighbours. You know what is on their hearts this week. Troubling them, worrying them, or giving them sense of joy and gratitude and thankfulness. Father, let us love them and lift them to you in a moment of silence. Be with us all, Lord. Keep us safe in your grace and let us feel your unconditional love. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. And now a blessing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love, now and forever. Amen. And let's say a blessing to the world. Together we say, To Christ be praise, to the cosmos hope, to the city, peace, to the church, courage. Amen. Amen.